All right, well, I am so excited for today. We have a fun passage today in Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. It's been a great journey going through the book of Colossians. We are on part 11 today. We have two more parts, so we're going to take a, a couple weeks off for some other things the next two Sundays, and then we'll close up Colossians after that. But over the last two weeks, we have seen that in Jesus, there's a whole new way of living available to us. There's this whole new way of living that is marked by holiness and love, and we've looked at what the or what that uh, or looks like. And now this week, Paul is going to continue that conversation by talking about how the whole new way affects how we do family, okay? And this is a really fun passage. We're gonna tackle marriage, uh, parenting, and slavery all in one sermon. So you're gonna be here a while. Let's check it out. Verse 18, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward." It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be, or be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. And masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. The sermon title this morning is Family Under Jesus. Family Under Jesus. Let's go ahead and pray for it. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning, and we thank you for your word. I pray that this word would come to life, and it would speak to our hearts, it would speak to our specific uh, situations and, and God we pray for transformation to happen this morning in Jesus name we pray amen amen whenever I heard the Ten Commandments as a child I became particularly frightened on the fifth commandment it says this it says honor your father and your and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you I was a pretty well-behaved kid but I particularly struggled with mouthing off and fighting with my parents I'm stubborn and I've never been one to back down from a fight. I don't know of a fight I've backed down from. So, so me and my mom, she's like that too. So, so we had our fair share of arguments growing up. I'd read this passage and I'd think, oh no, I'm definitely not going to live for a long time. One of my worst moments of mouthing off was uh, sometime in late middle school or early high school. I don't remember the contents of the conversation. Don't remember what we were arguing about. But I was, was really coming at her. And, and my mom was in the kitchen making a sandwich with a lot of condiments on it and a lot of vegetables. And back then, I did not like any condiments other than ketchup. And I really didn't like mayonnaise, but she had a lot of that on her sandwich. And I also wasn't a big vegetable guy. As my mom was making her sandwich, I was coming at her and so, about something, and eventually she had had enough. She picks up the sandwich and just heaves it in my direction. Slow motion sandwich coming through the air. Oh, man, it's just across the face. I was shocked. Then she told me to clean it up. My dad comes in. He says, Becky, that's not a good idea. And he starts to clean it up. Meanwhile, I went to the bathroom. I'm crying. I look in the mirror, and I start throwing the ultimate pity party. I'm like, Mom, how could you throw a sandwich at me? Especially one with mayonnaise. It's personal when you're throwing a mayonnaise sandwich at me. Looking back, I probably deserved it, but, but let's just say next time you want your kid to obey, try throwing a sandwich at them. I thought about the next time I wanted to, to mouth off, I thought about it. I said, I better be careful. So kids, beware. You never know what mom or dad might do. They might surprise you. In all seriousness, family is one of the hardest places to live out the gospel well. It's one of the hardest places to put the earthly nature to death, as we talked about back in, in verse 5. Our families are the people who who most of us feel like we can be our most authentic selves with, in this space, our flesh can easily reveal itself. It's really hard to put on an act in the home. And because of this, families can be places of deep pain and where deep wounding happens. And in fact, as a pastor, I, I see this firsthand. It seems that, that, or that most of the problems that adults are having are rooted in their childhood. They are, are rooted in childhood wounds. However, families can also be places of great transformation and great life. If we invite Jesus into our family life, it can be a place of healing and discipleship and transformation. 
and we can learn in this context how to forgive and how to receive forgiveness. We can learn how to bring healing to other people and to receive healing from others. And with all that being said, I'm eager to unpack one of Paul's clearest teachings on the family today. He gives us a Christian version of what was referred to as the household code in the ancient world, and I'm eager to unpack it. On the front end, I want to encourage you with two things. First of all, I write out my sermons word for word every week. Every single word is on this iPad. And I do a rough draft before editing it. And this rough draft was by far the longest rough draft I've ever written. It's not even close. There's just so much I could say about, about marriage and parenting and slavery. So bear with me if I don't cover everything you want me to cover today. It's not because I don't want to. It's not because I don't have a thought about it. It's because I don't want you to be here for three hours. Secondly, I want to encourage you to come in with an open heart. Maybe you're not married, and you're like, I don't think this applies to me. Or you don't have kids. You're like, that doesn't apply to me. Or you don't have slaves. Hopefully that's all of you. <laughs> or, or you're not a slave. Or I just want to encourage you to come in with an open heart. Or maybe you're offended by what you think the passage is saying, and you want to write it off immediately. No matter where you're at, suspend suspicion and seek curiosity today. Ask the Lord to reveal his heart for the family to you in such a way that it brings transformation. All right, with that being said, to understand the text, we first have to understand the context that Paul is writing in. It's important to know that Paul is not, he's not writing to a, a Midwestern, mid-sized American city in the 21st century. He was writing to an ancient Greco-Roman city in the first century that embraced patriarchy. Our understanding of the home and the family is almost unrecognizable from the way that the Colossians would have understood it. And for us, home is often a place of retreat and a place of rest. It's our... It's our little castle. It's our haven away from the world, right? That's how we view it. But, but for them, they thought of the family as a place of work or the home as a place of work and a place of worship and commerce all in one. Everything happened in the home. And we often think of a family as ideally two married adults who have children and, and raise them up together. And for them, the family was high, hierarchical. I was practicing that word this week. I don't think I said it right. But they had strict rules. And, and the family included slaves. The, the father figure would have been called the pater familias, which is a great thing. I want to get a shirt that says pater familias on it, which means the father of the family. He had certain rights that, that no one else had in the family. The pater familias technically had the authority to kill his infant offspring. He could expose them to death. He could sell his sons into slavery. He could physically punish his household members. He could end the marriages of his children. Imagine that. That would be wild. And he could violently kill his wife, his children, or his slaves without legal consequences. Thankfully, the pater familias seldom exercised these rights in the ancient world. But in theory, they had them. In this society, women were disdained and viewed as inferior to men. The famous Greek philosopher Aristotle said that women don't have the mental capacities or the strength to be leaders. And, and women didn't even have standing under the law. They couldn't testify in court. Uh, or female babies were often abandoned more frequently than male babies. In Roman marriages, there was often a huge age disparity between the man and the woman. The man would often be older and the woman would be uh, someone in their, their pre-teens or, or early teenage years. And wives would run the home and care for the family and the children while husbands would run off and do what they wanted and sleep with who they wanted to. And when Jewish women, at the, or not Jewish women, Jewish men at the time, or, or when they would go to the synagogue, they would often pray, thank you, God, that I'm not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Women and children were not equal to men. Men had all the power, and their wives, children, and slaves were viewed as less than it's in this context that Paul wrote words like this. He said, here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And then Galatians 3.28, he adds men and women to this. He says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, and nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This way of thinking would have knocked the wind out of people, like literally knocked the wind out of them, like what is going on here? So Paul, he is boldly speaking into the Greco-Roman world and casts vision for a whole new way of doing family under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And he does this by addressing the relationship between the pater familias and each member of the family. He starts with the most intimate and he works his way outward from the wife all the way to the slave. So I'm going to take each of these relationships and unpack them for you. And you're in for a bumpy ride. So let's take a look. The first one is wife and husband. Wife and husband. So 
before we dive into what Paul says specifically here in Colossians, I want to just note that I'm also going to pull in a longer version of the household code or code from Ephesians 5. In that code, Paul starts with this verse, and this verse serves as really the thesis for the entire code. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Before he goes into the household code at all, he starts with this idea. The baseline for all Christian relationships, but specifically for the husband and the wife, is a mutual submission. It's a mutual Holy Spirit-driven, laid-down-your-life-for-one-another type of relationship. It's setting aside your own interests for the good of the other. In Christian relationships, there's never a relationship where one person has all the power and dominates over the other. Instead, there's a mandate to serve one another and a mutual submission undergirding the relationship. And when men read this command to submit to one another, their heads would have started to spin. In 1 Corinthians 7, this one's, this one's crazy. Paul takes it as far to say that husbands don't have authority over their own bodies. He says this. He says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. That means they should have sex. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Aren't you glad you came to church today, husbands and wives? The wife does not have authority over her own body, but, or she yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife do not or do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer then come together again so that satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control so paul makes this staggering statement that wives don't just belong to their husbands but husbands belong to their wives this was so countercultural, even in our our modern western society that celebrates the equality of the sexes this idea it's countercultural. We often don't go into our marriages seeking to serve one another, but instead we wonder what's in it for us. If we're not feeling it anymore or don't feel like our needs are being met, we want to bail out on it. Paul is saying that if you want to have a healthy marriage, you need to have an, an abandonment from self and seek to serve the other. You can't hold back with an arms folded posture wondering what is in it for me. Instead, you need to jump into the arms of the other. It's important to note that by saying that they are called to submit to one another, Paul is not saying that they don't have different roles at all. Our genders are a gift from God, and men and women are fundamentally different. Okay, I can't tell you with exact detail what those differences are. I'm not a biologist and all that other stuff, but they go beyond pure biological makeup. I listened to a message by a pastor I deeply respect, who I relied on a lot for the sermon. His name is John Tyson. And he pointed out that if we want to try to, or if we try to nail down with concrete detail what those differences are, or try to make hard, fast rules for the marriage or how we're to function, we're going to drift into legalism. So we just need to know that, that we're different, and that's okay. Men and women are different. It's up to the man and the wife in each marriage to work out exactly what that looks like while still honoring the New Testament instructions. Okay, so with the limited time I have, just let me try to give you a picture of what Paul is calling us to. Let's start with the husbands first because I think that will help us understand the command to the wives. He says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay, so he's calling them specifically. He has a wide variety of words for love that he could use in the Greek language. He chooses agape love, which is, is uh, or the self-sacrificial love. He says, husbands are to agape their wives and not be harsh with them. Uh, Okay, so this would have been way more controversial than the call for wives to submit to their husbands. When he said, wives, submit to your husbands, they'd all be like, duh. We know we're supposed to do that. But, but for husbands to have to lay down their lives for their wives, that was crazy. Husbands actually have to do something in the marriage. Wow, they can't just do what they want. And actually, if you ask me, it seems to be the more difficult of the two callings. It, it's, it's not a light thing. This is a high calling for husbands. We need to love our wives with agape love. And the best picture we have for this kind of love is where Jesus laid down his life on the cross. And Paul says it this way in the Ephesians household code. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So just as Jesus gave himself up for the church, husbands are to do that for their wives. Naturally, at our worst, I'm speaking from experience, men are egotistical and self-centered and aggressive. But Paul says we must give all that up and choose humility 
and sacrifice. What a calling. Okay, he goes on in verse 26 of Ephesians. He says, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself, he's talking about Jesus in the church, as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Okay, so just as Christ died for the church to restore us to God and make us holy, husbands have a, a responsibility to help our wives reach their redemptive potential. Her discipleship and holiness is partially our responsibility. We need to give our lives to this. Okay, so just as we feed and care for our own bodies, or as the ESV says, nourish and cherish, we need to, or to nourish and, and cherish and care for our wives. So think about that, nourishing and cherishing, speaking words of life and encouragement, calling out her potential, being patient and kind and gentle. This is our calling. This is our mandate. It's something we are to give ourselves over to. I'll be honest. Since I wrote this message this week, it felt like there's this big weight on me. Man, I have a high calling as a husband. Like, this sounds like fun. Die to yourself, essentially, for your wife. Over the last 11 years of being married to Emily, it's been a slow journey of learning how to do this or how to do this. When we first got married, I was so selfish. I'm still selfish, but I was so selfish back then. The world revolved around me. I've had to unravel that mindset and learn to think about her needs and her interests. What I found is that when I consider her interests and view it as my job to cherish her and to care for her and to be gentle with her, she thrives and I thrive and our family thrives. Husbands are called to lay it all on the line for their wives. We're not the only one with a calling, though. Wives, this is what Paul says to you. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. While husbands and wives are both called to submit to one another, there seems to be an, an emphasis on the wife's call to submit to the husband. So what exactly does he mean by submit? I think it might be helpful to start with what he doesn't mean by it. He doesn't mean that husbands just get to sit on their lazy boy, drink beer and watch football and call the shots and dominate their wives. He's not saying that men in general have authority over women in society. Men, you do not have authority over my wife, right? No, he's not saying that. He is specifically addressing the husband and wife relationship. And he doesn't mean that, that the women don't have a call to lead at all. He doesn't mean that they don't have a call to lead in the family or in society or in the church. In fact, the Bible has a very robust view of what women are called to do in the home and society. It is ridiculous how how countercultural it was in its context think about this the first person that jesus appeared to after his resurrection so women did not even get to testify in court okay didn't have any legal standing the first person he appears to is mary magdalene she's the first testifier of the gospel the woman who who doesn't actually have standing in court she gets to be the first witness for jesus right and, and, and the holy spirit is being poured out on both men and women right men and women women prophesy and women preach the gospel. And women are called to lead and to walk in authority. That's why we empower women here at St. Church to be leaders and pastors. A great example of the robust calling of women comes from Proverbs 31. You read that and you're like, that woman is Wonder Woman, right? And, and it's the image of an ideal, a ideal woman, a, an ideal wife and mother. We get a picture of a confident, talks about how she's confident. She's gifted. She is skilled at at so many different things. She's intelligent. She has leadership ability. She provides for her family. She actually sells land. She's in real estate, selling some land. She, it talks about planting a vineyard. She's into winery too. She's got her own winery thing going on. She, she takes care of the poor. She's on the board of a nonprofit, right? She, she teaches and, and so forth. It's, it's robust. So whatever submission means, it doesn't mean that the women don't get to contribute to the leadership of the family or of the marriage. Okay, so with that in mind, what does it mean? Well, I think our corresponding passage in Ephesians 5 can help us out here. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits itself to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Okay, the word submit in Greek means to arrange under or to subject oneself. Okay, it was used as a military term in the Greek, in the Greek language, and it meant to arrange the troop divisions under a leader in non-military use it referred to a or it referred to a voluntary cooperation or yeah so that's what it meant so so this means that paul 
is calling wives to arrange themselves under their husbands, who is the head of the wife and the family. So notice, though, that this passage says nothing about the husbands ruling over their wives or commanding their wives. It says nothing about rule at all, actually. All it talks about is husbands giving up their lives for their wives. This is what leadership is in the kingdom, isn't it? We see it in Jesus' example, right? You don't, don't seek to see stuff for yourself or just lord it over other people. Instead, you lay down your life. That's what leadership is. So wives are called to arrange themselves under their self-sacrificial husbands who are laying it all on the line for their wives. This is what it looks like to submit. So John Tyson said it this way. He said, wives are called to let their husbands love them well. Wives are called to let their husbands love them well. That's what submission looks like. Let them love you. And this can actually be challenging for many women as they're often terrified of surrendering themselves to a man because of the abuse that happens at the hands of men and the apathy that so many men walk in these days. Out of fear, they often hold back from submitting, from coming under. And that holding back is really a fruit of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Before the fall, men and women were completely equal. They were, were ruling together in the garden. After the fall, all of a sudden a power struggle ensues between the two of them. And God says this to the woman. He says, and you will desire to control your husband. Some of you women have felt that before. Desire to control and kind of come over them. But he will rule over you. Because of, so this is a result of the fall. This isn't God's perfect will, right? Because of sin, Eve wanted to rise up over Adam and control him. And this has been a struggle for wives ever since. And, and, and it's really, it's not, it's the result of, of fear and a desire to protect. They don't trust their husbands. Women are terrified of being mistreated or being rejected by their husbands. They are terrified that their husbands won't have their best interests in mind. Right, that's what would cause you not to want to submit if you don't think that, that the leader you're submitting to has your best interest in mind. Here in our passage, Paul is calling women to fight against this urge to subvert their husbands and come under their self-sacrificial love. He's saying, let him love you as he follows in Jesus' example. Don't make it difficult for him. Open yourself up to him and surrender to him. Let him serve and honor and be the head of the family just like Christ is the head of the church. As he seeks to love you, he's not going to always do it well. He's going to mess up a lot. He's going to be awkward about it sometimes, too. He's going to try. But let him grow as he tries to love you. When he fails, encourage him. Don't play on his insecurities and nag at him, but instead, encourage him. Honor him. Speak life over him. So Paul sums up the teaching in Ephesians 5.33. He says, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There's something in men where they want to be respected. They deeply desire that. I know that personally. There's a deep, deep desire for respect from our wives and from people in general. And women where they want to be loved. They want to be cherished. They want to be cared for. If we want to have a fulfilling, God-honoring, redemptive marriage, we need to commit ourselves to love and respect. And this goes both ways, right? It's not like, hey, husbands, disrespect your wives. And wives don't love your husbands. No, it's both and. But there's a special emphasis on, on husbands just laying it all on the line for their wives and self-sacrificial service and wives encouraging and respecting and supporting their husbands. And, and here's the thing, if, if a husband fails or falls into harshness or pride, which we do, uh, or the call for the wife is to see that it comes from insecurity, right? That harshness, see the heart behind the, the stupidity, right? It comes from insecurity, that harshness, that pride. It comes from a deep wound of the heart. And instead of reacting to the husband, instead of reacting, respond to him with love and encouragement and, bring, and help bring healing to his heart. I don't know if there's anyone who, who is more positioned to bring healing to a husband's heart than the wife in the whole world besides Jesus. Bring healing to him in that moment. And in the same way, let's flip it around. When wives are being disrespectful or prideful, husbands do not lash out at them. Don't try to pummel them into submission. Instead, see that it comes from fear. And it probably comes from a deep wound of the heart and respond to it with love and encouragement. I feel like I could end the sermon here and do an altar call right now. But I want to cover the other two relationships. We'll come back to, or to marriage at the end. But, but let's go to child and father. Okay, child and father. Okay, the word fathers that, that Paul uses here can refer to parents of both sexes. But Paul seems to have a special eye on the fathers. So let's look at what it says. We'll start with children. It says children obey your parents and everything obey your parents and everything for this pleases the lord the fact that paul takes time to address the children with their own responsibilities and their own rights shows how the gospel is breaking new ground 
It's breaking new ground. Greek and Jewish society did not value children at all, not even close to the way we value them. There was a high infant mortality rate. They used their children for for labor, so they really couldn't afford to get sentimental about them. Children were the lowest of the low in society. In this context, Paul gives them attention. He gives them dignity, just as Jesus did. He calls children to obey their parents in everything, an echo of the fifth commandment. They are to do this, why? Because it pleases the Lord. Children are to come under their parents' authority and understand that just as the Lord disciplines his children because he loves them, parents are to do that for their children. And and what's really remarkable about this command is it shows that children were present in worship and were being treated as disciples. They were not JV Christians, but they were already followers of Jesus with commandments on their life. And and that's why our kids' ministry is so important. I'm so grateful for our our sent kids volunteers who, who serve on Sundays and on Wednesday nights and are discipling, helping us disciple our children into the way of Jesus. Can we give them a hand, our sent kids volunteers? Come on. I'm so grateful for them, what they do. And I just want to say... I'm excited for Wednesday night ministry to kick off this week. It is a big deal. It's so easy to overlook that, that part of our church. I mean, oh, that's just the kids getting child care. No, that's ministry happening back there. It is so important. I encourage you to bring your children. If you have children, bring them on Wednesday night. Even if you don't want to come to community, you can bring them, go on a date night, and come back and pick them up. We don't care. I'd like you to be in communities. It hurts my feelings. But other than that, go enjoy your date night. But get your kid into kids ministry. They are being bombarded all week long by content and by other sources of information and we need to get them into discipleship context as much as possible. Also, I want to speak to Sent Kids volunteers. If God has been been pulling on your heart to serve more, I want to encourage you to serve on Wednesday nights to, or to give that time. It's only an hour and a half to two hours. Give that time. It's so important. I, I just see this sometimes in general in life. I'm not talking about our kids volunteers. I'm saying in general where sometimes we, we don't value our children like we should. We give into the into the Greek and the Roman way of doing things. Like, oh, all these other things are more important. No, children are so important. It, 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 if you're not willing to pour into them, then who is going to? Right? So I just want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord, say, am I supposed to pour into our kids on Wednesday nights? And maybe you're not even in the kids' ministry yet. Maybe you're not a volunteer. Talk to Pastor Kennedy. We are, are looking for volunteers. We've been short this semester. We're growing as a church. We have almost doubled over the last year, and yet we have less volunteers than ever on Wednesday nights. So I just want to encourage you, let's step up, church. Let's take care of our kids. And let's get back there and serve. And I want to encourage you, too, if you're going to be in a community on Wednesday night, you could serve for, for once a month. I, I wouldn't encourage you to do it every week. Then you can't go to communities anymore. But, but hey, do it once a month and, and, and take one week off of your community once a month to, or to pour into our kids because they are that important. They are not an afterthought. They are vital to what God is doing on the earth. Come on, somebody. I get fired up about kids. I got a lot of them. <laughs> so I get, I get pumped about it. Okay, so... After addressing children, Paul then takes time to address fathers, which again is just crazy in this context that, that fathers would be given com- or commandments regarding their kids. It says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Other translations say, don't av- I almost said abrogate, aggravate or provoke or come down too hard on your children. This means don't have unrealistic standards for your children. And then come down on them when they miss the mark. Don't nag them. Don't belittle your children. Don't force them to be a carbon copy of you and to live up to some ideal that you have in your mind of who they're supposed to be. They are their own person. God has his own calling on their lives and let them figure that out. If you do these things, if you come down on them, if you have unrealistic standards, they will become discouraged and they will think they have little value or they may overcompensate and react to your criticisms by being boastful and proud and saying, I need to, to kind of puff myself up. Our job as parents is to live out the gospel towards our children. We need to help them to know that they are infinitely loved and accepted and valued despite their failures. Also, as we parent our children, we need to remember that it is really hard to be a kid. It is hard. Have you forgotten what it's like to be a child? I know I do at times when I'm parenting. I forget what it's like. It is hard to be a kid, and, and, and we need to remember that, that so many of our wounds come from our childhood, and, and we don't want to wound them in their childhood. So, so be prayerful, be thoughtful about how you parent your children. At the same time, we do need to discipline them. We need to guide them. We need to, to, or to guide them with patience and understanding and kindness. In Ephesians, it says this. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
as parents, we have a responsibility to train and disciple our kids. It is not sent kids' responsibility to train and disciple our kids. It's primarily our responsibility as parents. And we need to show them the way. We need to guide them on the way that they should go. All right, again, end of second sermon. Let's go to slave and master. So this is the longest section of the whole text. He spends a ton of time on this, which means they're probably struggling with this particular relationship, which makes sense why they were struggling with it. It's kind of weird to have slaves in the kingdom of God, but they did. And, and in Paul's day and age, slavery was commonplace. It was different than what you think of when you think of early American history. It, it was what you would think of as more of a household servant. Some wonder why Paul didn't call for all slaves to be freed. It's important to understand that slavery was absolutely central to ancient life. And calling for its end would be like calling for the end of electricity and gas in the modern world. You would all say, no, I'm not going to do that. We're going to still have electricity. It, it, it would have been fruitless for Paul to give himself to this. The church was a persecuted minority, and it did not have a voice. Rather than dreaming of impossible freedoms, Paul gives practical guidelines for the flourishing of slaves. He's not slaying or saying that slavery is good or that it's okay, but he's working within his cultural framework and sowing seeds that could eventually lead to the end of slavery. Okay, with that in mind, let's read what he says to slaves and masters. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Okay, so to those who are enslaved, Paul calls them to choose to obey their master out of their heart like they are obeying the Lord himself. He calls them to work with their whole heart as if they are working for the Lord. He promises them that if you do this, you're going to get an inheritance. You're going to get an inheritance in the resurrection. So, and to masters, he calls them to provide slaves with what is right and fair. He's calling them to give them justice and equality. They are not to treat their slaves like their property, but instead as other human beings in the family unit. And legally, the masters had no obligation to their slaves, but Paul says that they have an obligation under the Lord Jesus. He calls them to recognize that they are under the Lord and to treat their slaves accordingly. In Ephesians, Paul says this. He, he's just called the slaves to serve their master and then he says this back to the master. He says, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. This is remarkable. He's saying, treat your slaves in the same way that they are treating you. Serve them wholeheartedly. Serve your slaves. Although Paul doesn't come out and say it, it seems like he might be calling for an end of slavery as they knew it. Okay, with that in mind, I think we have two practical applications for today. If you have slaves, free them. No, that's the third one. That's the first one. Okay, that's just extra. Free your slaves. Okay, let's go to one and two. So one, that was zero. Now we're going to one. So first application is in our jobs, if you work, you should work with all your heart as if you're working unto the Lord. Right? Do your best and, and, and do it as worship, even if it's in less than ideal circumstances. Work is not just an obligation. It's not just a requirement or like, oh, I got to do this on the side. It is worship to the Lord. Treat it as such. Two, if you are in a position of a of authority or power, treat those under your authority as you would Jesus if he was working for you. Imagine that Jesus is working for you. Serve him, honor, and care for him. I think about the, about the least of these passage in Matthew 25 where, where Jesus says, what you do unto the least of these you did unto me. Think of your employees or those under your authority in that way. This is Paul's vision for how to do families well and really for how to do all of relationships well. If we want our families to thrive specifically, we must come under the lordship of Jesus Christ and serve one another. And, and we must not seek to be served, but to serve. This is the way to have healthy and flourishing, gospel-centered, spirit-driven marriages and families and relationships. And here's the beautiful thing. When families come under Jesus, we preach the gospel to the world. We are a sign and a wonder to the world when we do this right. As we, serve one, as we serve one another, as we submit to one another, we model the love of Christ who went to the cross. Ultimately, this whole sermon hinges on the call to serve. This is the application to take the posture of a servant. I'm a work in progress like all of you. A few years ago, 
Emily and I were going through a tough season of fighting a lot and fighting in an intense way, not a way that I'm proud of. And we were planting the church in that season. Hey, come to our church. And then screaming at each other at home. And we were having lots of babies. And it was just a tough season for both of us. And one morning I was on a prayer walk. And the Lord brought up a fight from like four months before as I'm walking and praying to him. I had already repented to Emily. said sorry. And we had made up long before that. But I just began to feel like the Holy Spirit was grabbing my heart and squeezing it. I felt this weight of how much I had failed as a husband, how I had missed the mark. I said mean things. I was harsh. I wasn't gentle. I attacked her insecurities, things that she's opened up to me about. I would then attack those insecurities. I had utterly failed. I didn't feel condemned by Jesus in that moment, but I felt this weightiness of conviction that I had totally failed in this way, and I knew I needed to stop being a little boy and grow up and to start really seeking to serve her. And not just wanting to be right. I was so obsessed and at times can still be so obsessed with being right. It's not that important. It's really not. To be right is not that important. And and since then, there's been a shift in our marriage. We're not perfect, but it's been so much better and healthier. And we still miss the mark, but we're on a journey. Okay, with all that being said, I want to end by applying this to ourselves. Husbands, are you following Jesus' Jesus' example in the way that you love your wives? Are you following his example? Look at him on the cross. Are you following that, laying down your life? Are you living into that vision? That is Jesus' vision for your marriage, that you would lay yourself down. And wives, are you, are you letting your husbands love you by submitting to them? Are you actually coming under their leadership and submitting to them? Are you letting them love you well? Or are you kind of staying guarded And children, I think we should broadcast this into the kids' wing. Children, are you surrendering to Jesus through the way you obey your parents? Are you obeying your parents? And and fathers and mothers, are are you modeling the gospel through the way you love and disciple your children? And finally, to speak to the slave and master relationship. This isn't a perfect correlation, but again, to those who are under authority, are you working with all your heart as if you're working to the Lord? And to those who are in authority, are you loving those under your care well? I recognize that as you think about the way that you, that you relate to your spouse or your children or to your loved ones in general, if you're not married or have kids, it can be convicting when you think about how you miss the mark. It can be weighty. It can really kind of feel crushing. And it's easy to want to shirk it off. Like, I don't want to feel those feelings of shame or conviction and just shirk it off. Or it's easy to fall into shame and just say, I'm no good, I'm terrible, how could I ever change? I, I want to encourage you to resist both of those ways of responding, those temptations, and to respond differently. If you're feeling convicted today, I want to give you three simple encouragements. First, respond to this by repenting. It starts with repentance. Repent this morning. Restoration and freedom begins with repentance. Repentance means to turn the other way or to change your mind. Resolve to make a change this morning. Say, I'm not going to keep doing this the way I've been doing it. Marriage is not about you. It's not about you getting your needs met. It's about serving someone else. Parenting is not about you. It's not about your kids you know, doing all the things you wish you could do and, and, and living into your dream for their lives. It's not about you. And your relationships are not about you. Work is not even about you. You're trying to bring... You're, you're trying to, or to work under the Lord to see the world flourish in your work. It's not about you being fulfilled or happy. Make a change this morning. Acknowledge that you have, have missed the mark. And then after repenting, here's the beautiful thing. After you repent, not just like, a, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. But you really feel the weight of it. You turn from it. After that, receive the love of God. Receive the love of God. If we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're at the end of your life and you have totally failed as a husband or a wife or as a parent. Maybe your kids are grown up, they're gone, and you're like, man, there's so many things I should have done differently. If, if, if that's you, grace is still available for you today, right? Even if you can't make things right and go back and change it, grace is available. And here's the beautiful thing, eternity is long. Eternity is long. We so often forget, you know, this week, I had several conversations with people in the older generation and and each of them said to me, you know, I don't have as much time left. 
on this earth as you do. It was weird. It was like three conversations in a row. And here's the thing. We do have the same amount of time left because we're headed towards resurrection, right? Jesus is going to restore everything. Eternity is long. He's going to raise up your dead body on the last day, and we're going to reign with God forever. Eternity is long. So even if you feel like you missed the mark in this earthly life, there is so much time to be had where you can, can live into the way of Jesus. And the beautiful thing is in the resurrection, Jesus is going to change your heart. He's going to help you to actually live the way that he's called you to live. So I pray this morning that you would not give in to shame or beating yourself up, but instead saying, I'm going to do my best with the time I have left. I'm going to pass this on to the next generation, and I'm looking forward to eternity. Right? Or, or, or maybe you, you have kids, or you're currently raising your kids right now, and, and, and you're feeling the weight of, of missing the mark in parenting. Here's the beautiful thing. We can change. Right? I think about Romans 12 where Paul says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be renewed by, uh, or be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right? That suggests that we can change. Right? We can change. We don't have to be conformed to the patterns of this world or our old patterns. Instead, we can be renewed. So it's not too late to change. Let's change together. Let's seek to do this right as a church. Let's seek to do, or to do marriage and, and, and parenting and all of this right. Or maybe you've been in your workplace and you've just been thrown a fit. You don't do it with joy. You are grump. You bring down the whole atmosphere of the workplace. It's not too late to change. It's not too late to change. And, and maybe you're retired. You're like, I, I, don't, I don't work anymore. Well, whatever you're working on, you're working on something, right? Whatever you're doing, work as if you're working unto the Lord. Give your last years, give your, your I think, last and best years in so many different ways. Give them to the Lord. Say, I'm going to work as unto the Lord. And I think I already got to this point. But the third thing, so you receive the love of God that God had in myself, and then you come under Jesus. This last thing, come under Jesus. This is what it looks like to come under Jesus. You're, you're pursuing the new way, right? You're pursuing his way of doing family and relationships and marriage and parenting and all of that. You're pursuing his way. So you repent, you receive his love and forgiveness. You don't, you don't wallow on the past. Instead, you move forward and you say, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to do it under Jesus. In our nine verses, the lordship of Jesus Christ is mentioned seven times. Seven times. You can see the centrality of that idea that Jesus is Lord over your family. Come under his lordship. Let him be your guide and your model and follow his way. As you do that, or do that, watch Jesus move in your heart and in your relationships. If we can get this right, we're gonna model Jesus to the world. We're gonna show the world that Christ is Lord. We're gonna show the world what that actually looks like to be under Christ. He's not just the Lord at church, but he's the Lord in our homes and in our workplaces. He's the Lord of all of life. And this will be a sign and a wonder to the world. People will be interested in bringing their lives under the Lordship of Jesus Christ as they see us thrive under it. It's critical that we get this right. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet all across this room. We're gonna close. prayer team can come up too. We're going to respond here with, with really one response. And I want to open the altars up today. In the scriptures, the altar was a place where people sought God. It's a place where they built memorials to him. They said that things are going to be different now. There were places of sacrifice, places of commitment and surrender, saying, I'm going all in. They were also places where people received the love and the mercy of God. As a church, I want to encourage you, as many people as possible, to get to the altars this morning and seek the Lord. Say, I want to do family right. I want to do relationships right. I want my family, my relationships to be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to close with a song and time at the altar. So, Jesus, right now, I pray that you would work on every heart in this room, whether they be people who are single, people with kids, single moms, single dads, husbands and wives, grandparents, no matter who people are or where they're at, students. I pray that you would begin to speak to us right now about what you want to do in our hearts as we look at this, this household code. God, I pray that you'd help us to serve you with our whole hearts, to, to give ourselves to serving others and to not be in life for, or for what's in it for us, but, but instead to, or to seek how we can serve. So God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to open up the altars. I would encourage you to come, get here, and, and put a stake in the ground with the Lord saying, I'm going to do this right. Let's go ahead and worship.